Hare Krishna. So today, since Yanmashtami is coming soon, I'll speak on one of the pastimes of Krishna and we'll talk about not just the story but some important lesson that we can learn from the story. This is a story many of you may have heard of, of the first demon who attacked Krishna when he was barely out of his mother's lap. Can you guess which demon are we talking about? Putana, yes. So we'll talk about the the principle of trust and its betrayal and its restoration based on the story of Putana. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur is one of the prominent Acharyas in our tradition and he explains how every demon in Krishna Leela represents a misgiving, a weakness in our heart and how that weakness can attack us and how that weakness can be overcome. That is what we can learn from the past time. So quickly I'll tell the story then we'll come to the point of the drama where this lesson will especially become significant. There are few things in the world which uh, inspire a protective instinct as much as vulnerability. When we see anyone who is vulnerable, we want, we, there's a natural part within us which wants to help. If some say somebody can't see and they're trying to cross a road and they're struggling, any half decent person will want to assist them cross over. So anybody in, with vulnerability, that it attracts a desire to help, a desire to protect. And there is nothing as vulnerable as a newborn baby. All living beings, uh, when they have their progeny, the progeny is weak and needs protection. But among all such living beings, it is the human beings whose progeny actually requires protection for the longest period of time. And this, crea this is meant to create a deep bond between the parents and the progeny. And one way that bond is created is that when the parents, or not just the parents, any caregiver, uh, any adult, see the vulnerability of a small baby, it attracts attention, it attracts affection. Now, even people who are normally very grave and even scary looking, if they come in front of a baby, they start playing. <laughs> and you can see almost a dramatic transformation. What happened? So, that small, tender, vulnerable disposition of a child attracts, attracts and then it especially attracts a protect, activates a protective instinct within us. And it requires an extraordinarily inhumane degree of cruelty to want to hurt a baby. Most of us will not knowingly want to hurt anyone or to speak of a small, tender, vulnerable baby. And demons are such that their characteristics are often the opposite of human. Not just human, but humane characteristics. Demons are said to be evil. Now, evil, what does it mean? It essentially means to produce suffering for the sake of producing suffering. That is the very essence of evil. Sometimes suffering is just accidental. Say we are, we are running towards something very urgent and we step on someone's feet. That's accidental. Sometimes it's unavoidable. Mm. Say there's so much crowd 
that we put our feet to somebody else. Sometimes it may be intentional but essential. Say for example, somebody has a somebody has some infection and they have to be given an injection. So all these you could say this kind of suffering is excusable. Either it is an accidental, unavoidable, or intentional and unavoidable. Sometimes it is unavoidable and unintentional. Sometimes intentional and unavoidable. But when suffering is intentional and avoidable, that is evil. And there is no need for that suffering. There is no uh, purpose for that suffering and still somebody causes suffering. Then that intentional and avoidable suffering is evil. Having said that, the demons often like to cause this kind of suffering. And Putana represents this to an extreme degree because she, it was, although she came to attack Krishna, uh, attacking Krishna was not, attacking small babies was not a one-off activity for her. It was a habitual activity. That means she had desensitized herself. She had become so cold-hearted that just routinely she would kill babies. So, when Krishna was born, there was a pro Krishna of course is never born, he appears in the world. Like the sun appears in the sky, it's not the sun is created at that time. So Similarly, Krishna appears in this world. At that time there had been a prophecy before his birth that he, the eighth child of Devaki, would be the cause of the death of Kamsa and therefore Kamsa was determined to kill all the children of Devaki. Through an elaborate arrangement Krishna was taken to Vrindavan and he survived. But Kamsa suspected that maybe the eighth child of Devaki is born somewhere and we should, should I, I need to finish him. So then he told, he told, he, f he had to find someone who would kill Kamsa, kill Krishna. So he called Devaki. So he called Putana. When he called Putana and he told her that don't that just go in the nearby vicinity and wherever you find small babies, just kill all of them. Just kill all of them. Even among demons. Those demons who kill small babies are especially cruel. Demons are themselves cruel, but those who kill especially small babies, it's it's horrible. Sometimes when abortion is done, especially if it's a late term abortion, then instead of the baby getting aborted, the baby is born. And then there are laws and once the baby comes out of the womb, you cannot abort the baby. So recently in New York, uh, the, there is a debate going on that if a baby is born, still the baby can be aborted. Uh, and that caused outrage. No matter what, when the, when the child is born, how can you kill? So even among people who might think that there is nothing wrong with abortion, but even they find it scandalously wrong that a child is born, how can you kill? The point is that Putana had an especially cold-hearted nature because of which she was deputed to kill babies. And it is not just uh, one, he did not know where Krishna was, so just kill all the babies. So it's like say, you know, one child, uh, say in the neighborhood where there are a lot of pet dogs, the suspicion that one suspicion that one pet dog has a rabies, and somebody decides that kill all the dogs in this neighborhood, not just the neighborhood, the whole city, vicinity, everywhere. It's it is disproportionate. Sometimes say suppose one terrorist is hidden in some big locality, and the police should find the terrorist and kill it. But if somebody decides that just 
blow up the whole locality. Hundreds, thousands of people who might be living in that part of the city, everybody will killed. So this was the ruthlessness of Kamsa in planning and it was in executing Putana. Now when Putana came to Vrindavan, Vrindavan is a big area. Initially Krishna lived in a place called Gokul within Vrindavan. And when she came to Gokul, she decided to sneak in. And for sneaking in, she took on a form that would lower the guard of people. Generally speaking, whenever we see a stranger, there is some caution, maybe suspicion also. And sometimes it is good with good reason. We don't know a person is a stranger, we don't know what their intentions are. Of course, you could say that even people whom we know, we don't know what their intentions are. But over a period of time, when we live with them for a long time, or our family with them for some time, then we can figure out their intentions to some extent. So, but strangers, we have our guard initially. So now, the way to, if that stranger has something attractive, then our guard gets lowered a little bit. Say, if he is suspicious that somebody is going to come to rob money from us. And then if that person comes in a car that is bigger than ours, you might think, you know, this person, they already have so much. They are unlikely to rob. Of course, sometimes some thieves might temporarily get a big car just to lower our guards. So, but the point is, whenever anybody has something which is attractive, something which is impressive, something which is captivating, then that lowers our guard. Say for example, somebody comes and starts speaking very sweetly, wisely. Oh, this seems to be like a learned person. Then that also lowers our guard. Maybe I want, they know what they are speaking. So similarly, Putana, when she wanted to come in, she wanted to lower the guard of the Vrajivasis. So she took on a very attractive form. And this attractive form was such that it attracted everyone. The female form has two broad things. It actually applies to everyone. But there is the sexual aspect, there is the maternal aspect. So her form was so attractive that the men who saw her, they so beautiful. They thought that, is she some apsara from the heavens? And they were captivated by her, but because she was so, she looked so celestially beautiful, nobody suspected her of any evil intentions. And then as she came into the center of Gokul, then the women saw her. And she looked attractive, but for them, for Yashoda and Devaki, Yashoda and Rohini and others, they saw in her maternal beauty. So she had both, so whoever might have a raised guard, she brought the guard down for both men and women and she came in. And, and she was, she clearly came in with the intention of uh, nursing Krishna, of offering her breast milk. Now, in many traditional cultures, in today's culture, many times even the mother doesn't want to give her breast milk to the child. They want to replace and have some artificial milk. But in traditional cultures, often there was the idea that if a baby drinks the breast milk from many mothers, many women, then that will nourish the baby even more. Because the nutrients from many different mothers will enter into that, that baby. So, it was a sign of maternal affection for women to nurse, for a baby to be nursed by multiple women or for women to nurse multiple babies. So Yashoda was there and she was the mother of Krishna and she had abandoned breast milk. But when Putana came, she was so attractive 
attractive in such a maternally affectionate way that Rohini and Yashoda, their guards got lower. And right in front of them, she came to Krishna. And while they were all watching, they were so charmed. So charmed that you just didn't think of this completely strange woman because she was just so attractive that her strangeness didn't register in them. And some of them thought that maybe, oh, this is a celestial damsel, is she the goddess of fortune? So who is she? And they just let her come inside. And when she came inside, right up to Krishna, and she wanted to feed Krishna. And she picked Krishna up. Now as she came near Krishna, Krishna closed his eyes. Krishna can see us, not just our appearance, but also our inner world, our substance. So Krishna could see her dark heart and he just didn't want to see it. He, for all of us, if we are given an inner torchlight to look inside us, most of us would turn the torchlight away because there is a lot of darkness within us. Of course, there is a light of divinity within us. At the core of our being, there is a soul, which is a power part of God, which is godly. But surrounding that soul, there is a lot of darkness. And we would not want to see it. The darkness is quite ugly, quite unbearable at times. There is anger, there is greed, there is envy, there is lust. There are so many dark things in our heart. Now, in some people, those dark things are immediately evident. But most people conceal those dark things within their hearts. So Krishna could see her dark intentions and Krishna closed his eyes. Now, normally, if we consider when do we, if we see something new, it's interesting, Krishna's reaction was actually the opposite of the reaction of everyone else. She was so beautiful that everybody was irresistibly captivated by her. And everybody was just looking at her looking at her wherever she was going. But in Krishna's case, Krishna was not at all captivated by her. And Krishna closed his eyes. Now generally, when do we close our eyes? Multiple possibilities. One is that, say when we are tired, we just want to sleep. Second is when we are very fearful. We don't know what, we just see something terrible and we just don't want to see it. So close their eyes. Or, so I just feel, feel very comfortable and just relax. So in this case, Krishna didn't want to see what was happening. Now he did not just want to see because her heart was so ugly. When Putana saw this, he started thinking, oh. Now she, she was a demoness and as a demoness she used to, she sometimes had to fight with others. So she could assess the strength of others. And something within us said, this Krishna is not an ordinary boy. Maybe he is very powerful. But then, when she started thinking like this, so she had lowered the guard of everyone, but her own guard was rising up. Hey, this Krishna, who is he? Generally, you say somebody is a boxer. Now, some people who are boxers, they might be very hugely built. Some people might be very slim and wiry, but still they might have very strong muscles. And we might not see their muscles, we may not even see their size, but when they start fighting, they know oh, they have so much strength. So now if somebody is trained as a fighter, then just by the way the other person moves, they can, oh, this person is... If a fighter has to say fight with five people, he can make out. You know, these four are not tough, but this this is a tough guy. So they can make out. They can assess the strength. If any fighter has survived, they have the they have the capacity to assess strength. So 
something within her said this Krishna is dangerous. So Krishna closed his eyes and he made her lower the guard. He thought this is just an ordinary baby, he's gone to sleep. And then she picked him up. And when she picked him up, at that time, she in front of everyone just offered him, offered him her breast milk. And Krishna started drinking. And he kept drinking. And he kept drinking. And her plan had been extremely devious. Generally, if somebody wants to say kill someone, they have to uh, carry some weapon. But she had not brought any weapons with her. But what she had done was she had smeared her breast with poison. And her plan was Krishna will drink the milk and Krishna will eat the poison. And that poison will kill him. And she had put a extremely virulent poison abundantly on her breast. And Krishna, small children don't have any capacity to doubt. If they started doubting, then they would not survive. So we need to trust. We cannot function without trusting in life. But sometimes our trust is betrayed. And then, uh, naivety in trusting is bad because we will be betrayed. But cynicism, where there is complete inability to trust, that is also bad. So trusting is a strength. But we also need intelligence to be able to discern whom to trust, whom not to trust. So children are born with that innate capacity to trust. As babies. So, and when somebody is so vulnerable and so trusting, at that time to betray that person, to attack that person is especially vicious. So she planned to have Krishna die by that poison. Now Krishna consumed that poison and consumed the milk, but he was completely unaffected. Even when God is a small baby, he, doesn't, he is not small. Sometimes people think God's greatness must be that, hey, how can a small baby be God? God must be very great. See, God's greatness is such that even in his smallness, he can contain his greatness. He doesn't have to be physically great. He can be small and yet he can be great. So his great is, uh, greatness is not a physical attribute. Some people are very tall. Now for others, oh, you are so tall, that's impressive. But those people who are tall, they are stuck with their tallness. If there is a low door, then they can't go as easily as everyone else can. But God is the strongest, God is the biggest, but he is not stuck with his bigness. He can be as small as he wants and still he can manifest all the strength that he wants through that. So Krishna, although he appeared vulnerable as a small baby, he was invulnerable to that poison. And then he kept sucking, he kept sucking. And then he started sucking her life air away. And she was shocked. He had to push the child away. But Krishna had held on so tightly that she started screaming. Pushing now. She's a, she's a powerful demoness. Although she had taken on the attractive form of a woman, but still the power was there. She pushed and pushed. And yet Krishna would not let go. Krishna just held on tightly. And then for all the demons, they need to have, they need to have, they, whenever they assume a form, they invest some of their mystic powers to maintain that form. And then when uh, they, they are on the verge of death, then all their power gets concentrated on self-defense. And in the mystic power that they had invested in maintaining that, that garb, that form, that is dissipated. And that's why as those, these are about to die, their natural form comes up. 
So Putana was a huge, hideous demon. Demoness. And she tried to run away from the village to try to get rid of Krishna. Pushing him away. I can't physically push him away. Let me run. Maybe he will fall off. She just ran as desperately as she could. Now Krishna could have ended her life at that time itself. But because she resumed a big form, she if she had crashed down in the village itself, she would have damaged Vrindavan. So Krishna allowed her to run. And run and run. She ran out of the village and then finally Krishna sucked out her life air. And this huge demoness who could so effortlessly have killed a baby was killed by that baby. Shri Krishna Bhagavan ki Jai. Now, Bhakti Vinod Thakur says that Putana represents a misleading teacher. A misleading teacher, a false guru. What is the rationale for this correlation? A teacher is someone whom we trust. And if a teacher misleads, then they are abusing a sacred trust. The bond of sacred trust between a teacher and a student is the basis for education and the furtherance of life. And to misuse, to abuse that sacred bond is heinous. So what Putana did was, she was similarly abusing another sacred bond. It is a bond of a mother and a child. <coughs> Just as the teacher gives the milk of education for the student to grow, grow intellectually, grow in mind, grow in intelligence, grow in future prospects. So similarly, mother gives milk which enables the baby to grow. And if that if the teacher abuses that, then it's grievous. The more, so what Bhakti Vinod Thakur does is, there are specific incidents with specific characteristics, which, uh, which are manifested by the demons. Now the kind of specific incidents that may happen in, uh, that happen in Krishna's life, may not happen in our life. But rather than thinking of these stories simply as some ancient stories from long time, uh, from uh, distant past, you know, these stories represent some universal archetypes, some universal patterns that are repeated. So he takes those specific incidents and he expands to the, uh, them so that they become relevant to all of us. So for most of us, we won't face a situation uh, like Krishna faced with Putana, specifically. But the whole idea of a sacred bond of trust being misused is something which we see so often in today's world. That So with respect to false teachers, the idea is that in the world, actually, the world is so peculiarly designed that it is very easy to fool people and it is very difficult to convince them that they have been fooled. <laughs> so most people even after they have been fooled they live in denial. No, 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 that doesn't happen. So what happens is to be fooled is bad enough but to be exposed as a fool is much worse. So, if we buy something, say it's $50, but we paid $500 for it. Now, if we realize it, we'll be very angry. How did I get cheated like this? But if somebody points out, we'll try to defend. No, actually it's $500. It's very special. <laughs> now, what you have is ordinary. What I have is special. So, <laughs> what happens is that to, <laughs> to convince people that way, that they have been fooled. To fool people is easier than to convince people that they have been fooled. So because of this, sometimes um, when teachers, they teach. If 
they teach something wrong, then they are betraying the trust and for those who have been misled to even understand that we have been misled, it takes a long time and thus they stay deluded. So just as Yashoda, she would nourish Krishna with her milk and not just with her milk but with her love. So when that nourishment is given, there is the there is the external or physical component that is milk, but there is also the internal component that is love. So what keeps all sacred bonds together is not just the external transaction that happens. The mother gives milk, but through the milk, the mother and the child get bonded. The mother's love flows to the child through the milk. And that's what makes the makes the bond real. So similarly, the Bhagavatam says, when a teacher is teaching, the teacher should be snigdha, should be affectionate to the students, should be concerned about the students. If the teacher is thinking, how much money can I get from whom? Of course, the teacher may be earning a, li may be earning a livelihood and that's fine. But if the teacher becomes very calculative, then the teacher will become exploited, become discriminating. Oh, this person can give more, this person can give less. And that way, that sacred bond gets abused. Now, Krishna, he was not taken in by Putana's deceptiveness, although everybody else was taken in. So that same Krishna is present in our hearts. And if we connect with Krishna, if we, because in the world, by appearance it's very difficult to know who is trustworthy and who isn't trustworthy. There was a famous atheist who was asked, do you believe in hell? Now, the, the questioner thought that obviously the answer would be no. If he is an atheist, he would be, doesn't believe in God. He doesn't believe in the opposite of where God goes. That's the, where the godless go. Is hell. He said, of course I believe in hell. Oh, really? He said, what is your conception of hell? He said, he said hell means other people. <laughs> <laughs> so, he had such a bad, so many bad experiences with people. He said, people are in trouble, people are hell. It's an extremely cynical view of people and of relationships. But in this case, so oh, we cannot be that, we cannot afford to be that cynical. But we cannot afford to be naive also. So if we get the presence of Krishna in our heart, it just as Krishna saw through the facade of everyone, through the facade that nobody else could see through. So similarly, Krishna will get, give us pointers from within. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita in 10.10, Tesham satata yuktanam bhajutam preeti purvakam tadami buddhi yogam tam yenamam upayanti te says, tadami buddhi yogam tam He says, I will give you the intelligence. By which you can come to me. Now this is very significant. Krishna is not saying here, I will give you the intelligence by which you will solve all your problems. He said, I will give you the intelligence by which you can come to me. That means that sometimes as uh, souls who are living in the material world, as people who are living in today's world, we will also encounter deceptive people. And Krishna is not necessarily saying that I will solve your problems or I will give the intelligence by which all your problems will be solved. That means sometimes we might face a problem and Krishna can give us the intelligence by which we may solve the problem. We may solve the problem. Sometimes we might meet some untrustworthy person and we might get some warnings. No, no, don't trust this person. Just keep a distance from them. Sometimes it might be that we, some people might be just such smooth talkers 
but even we might be misled by them but krishna says either way whether you find somebody trustworthy or you encounter somebody untrustworthy i will give you the intelligence by will you will come to me now some people in our lives they very lovingly lead us toward god some people kick us toward god so sometimes uh, when we meet trustworthy loving people we feel inspired our faith in the goodness of humanity in the goodness of existence in the goodness of god increases by such people by interacting with such people but sometimes our faith can be shaken because people can be so terrible at times but if we see that through both if we try to be devotionally connected then we'll be uplifted in this world there is no guarantee of protection from problems but there is krishna provides the guarantee that he will help us learn through problems and evolve towards him so dadami buddhi yogam tam yena mam upayanti te that if we become devoted to him if we infuse krishna's presence in our heart then gradually we'll become uplifted and through every situation through our encounters with with trustworthy people we will learn and we will grow through our encounters with untrustworthy people we will learn and we will grow and we need all kinds of lessons to evolve in our life journey so that krishna's uh, krishna who was present in vrindavan and who is always manif- present in our hearts but is not manifest if we practice his bhakti and start invoking his presence then he will guide us to remove the confusion from within our hearts the darkness within which makes us blind to the realities outside and he will enable us to march toward him so i'll summarize we can have some questions after that so i spoke on this theme of how about the demons in krishna leela i spoke today about putana i started by talking about each demon represents a particular misgiving in the heart and now putana came so it requires cruelty to to hurt anyone it requires a special cruelty to hurt someone filled with vulnerability and a baby newborn baby is the most vulnerable but putana she not only was ready to kill one but that was her that was her full time job killing babies and even among demons there are special high levels of cruelty in her so she came and she got everyone to lower their guard the men she attracted her by their be- by the men by her beauty and the women she attracted by her by maternal bearing and she came in front of everyone to krishna and krishna closed his eyes so that he didn't want to see her evil disposition and he also wanted her to lower her guard because she started sensing this krishna something something all extraordinary and then krishna and she sucked uh, krishna when she offered her milk to for krishna to suck she found that krishna sucked out her life also and krishna let her live till she could run far enough so that she would not cause any destruction in vrindavan directly go gokula so then we discuss that bhakti thakur says this represents the false teacher the misleading teacher just as the mother offers milk which nourishes the child the teacher offers knowledge wisdom that nourishes the student and to abuse that just as putana abused the milk which is meant to nourish to kill similarly sometimes some people might use the knowledge which is meant to educate to exploit to manipulate and that is a terrible betrayal of trust and then I concluded by just as krishna uh, was able to see through the facade of putana when we invoke krishna's presence in our heart he will help us to see through appearances and even if sometimes we are not able to see through appearances krishna says i'll give you the intelligence by which you can come to me 
sometimes we learn we are led toward krishna by some people who are loving and we are sometimes pushed toward krishna kicked toward krishna by people who are very the, the opposite of loving but either way by having krishna manifest in our hearts we will always evolve towards him thank you very much hare krishna so any questions or comments yes please oh, uh, thank you for such a nice class you know give us some precious gems that we can apply in our life. Uh, the question that I have, or a few questions I have is, uh, so Putna was defeated by Kamsa to, to kill Krishna. And we know that Kamsa killed, he was also killed many babies uh, with six children. So are there any parallels between his sort of deception, I mean, not in that sense, but his cruelty and that of Putna's uh, as one thing? And, and what does he re represent as a demon? Um, and my other question is, um, the, the inhabitants of Radhaman, they're solely attracted to Krishna, like they're not attracted to anything but Krishna. So how is it that they got attracted to, to Putna? Was it the fact of Yoga Maya or some other potency or something? Okay, good question. So first question is, are there any parallels between say Kamsa's killing of uh, babies and Krishna's kill and uh, Putana's killing? Uh, yes and no, both involve certain amount of brutality, it's horrible. But in the case of Putana, as I said, it was, she was a Khichari, a particular demoness who would go around killing babies. Whereas Kamsa, he had a particular fear that Devaki's son would kill me. So she, he was not going around killing all babies. So basically, he killed Devaki's children. But as long as his target was fixed, he was killing Devaki's children one by one. But then, when he felt the target had slipped away, then he also became indiscriminate. And then he sent Putana. So you could look at it in two different ways. Um, so suppose somebody hires a mercenary, hires a hires somebody to kill somebody else. Mm. So now who is more brutal? Is it the murderer who is brutal or the person who hired the murderer who is brutal? You don't know. Sometimes it's, it's the murderer who is brutal, and this person may say, "I don't even want to see the dead body. Just do it and don't even." I'll give you the money, don't even talk with me about, about afterwards. But sometimes it might be that the murderer is even more brutal. This uses this is a small job, you do it for me. So Kamsa had his own cruelty. So you cannot say one particular case is more. So Kamsa definitely was cruel and his cruelty was exhibited in different ways. He was ready to kill even his own sister. And that too, it's like you say there is sin. There is sin square and there is sin cube. <laughs> so to kill, kill a woman, that's bad enough. To kill one's own sister is worse. And to kill one's own sister on the day of her wedding, that is a day of such a great joy and sanctity. To do that. So that is not sin, not sin square, but sin cube. So he was ready to do that. So. In that sense, his cruelty is also no less. And specifically, his killing of babies was because he felt that they were an immediate threat to her, threat to him. As Putana's killing was just because it was, that was her nature, that was her job, that was what she did. So it's not exactly like a linear scale comparison, but we can look at the context and see that both of them are cruel. Okay. Now, yeah, how with the Vrachivasi is, attracted to Putana and they only attracted to Krishna. Yes, sometimes we have this idea that to spiritualize ourselves is not to dehumanize ourselves. Even when we become spiritual, we still remain human beings. So to spiritualize ourselves is not to dehumanize ourselves. The natural human emotions that come but they don't control. 
they don't control someone now for the brajwasi specifically see the, the scripture is such that when a particular point is to be emphasized it is that point is highlighted and everything else is subordinated for highlighting that point so for example in narsimha leela it is said that everybody was terrified of hiranyakashipu and everybody was bowing down to hiranyakashipu to the extent not only the gods but even the godly sages narad muni was bowing down to hiranyakashipu and the only person who was ready to defy him who was that pralad and then we see later on also that when hiranyakashipu was killed at that time the devas offered prayers even brahma ji offered prayer but the lord was not pacified by anyone except uh, except pralad it said even lakshmi devi she came there but she said i haven't even I, mean, i have not seen anyone like him like this so so what is going on over here now is it so the point is that in this particular past time so is prahlad more glorious than lakshmi devi is prahlad more glorious than his guru uh, narad muni no not not like that but in this particular leela the glory of prahlad is highlighted and for that purpose everything is orchestrated in such a way that his glory comes out so every leela has a particular purpose and whenever anyone behaves in a particular way within a particular past time it is often orchestrated to highlight the purpose of that past time so in the case of krishna leela in this particular past time so the point was to highlight here was that putana's deceptiveness the putana's deceptiveness was such that she could attract anyone and everyone but she couldn't deceive krishna so to highlight that point the brajavasis also appear to be deluded and they appear to be attracted see basically whatever is required for krishna leela is done in vrindavan so the we can say even the gopas when later on aghasuras past time comes up the gopas are with krishna but still they say oh this uh, this agasur seems to be like like nice playing place they they are not sure whether this actual snake or it's not they think maybe it's not actual snake it's a nice playing place. let's go inside it so now if they are there with krishna why should they be attracted to anyone else anything else somehow just because this is male and female so i think this is objectionable whereas the the ka the gopas getting attracted to a snake for a play field we feel that's that's not object that's just playful but the point is that any kind of attraction if somebody is fully attracted to krishna why would they get attracted to anything else but the point is it's not that krishna delights in everybody getting only attracted to him krishna delights in the reciprocation of love and whatever is required for the reciprocation of love that krishna does that so whether uh, so when mother yashoda is feeding krishna milk and she is uh, she's feeding krishna her breast milk but she sees the milk on the stove overflowing she puts krishna aside and she goes there now is krishna is the milk more valuable than krishna now at that time for the furtherance of this past time krishna being deprived and thereby krishna getting angry that's what is required and mother yashoda she is attracted to that thing but after that is also the service attitude he oh i have to feed this milk to krishna but the point is that it's not that in vrajalila everyone will be constantly equally exclusively attracted to krishna there may be for the purpose of leela they get attracted to certain other things temporarily so there is temporary attraction to something else but there is overall attraction only to krishna we see sita was with ram but sita was attracted to a deer a through that the lila went on but if she had been like she was so casually attracted but she was she was attracted to a deer but she was not attracted to ravan when ravan propositioned her so there are for the purpose of past times even great characters may act in ways that did not may not seem devotional but it's all for the purpose of furthering the devotional lila of the lord okay thank you any other question yes please. thank you so much for your so many of the gems that you have given us as prabhu mentioned you know when we reach shiva bhagavatam 
it's it, when we read it, it's not obvious. Like, you know, don't judge the book by the cover where Krishna is looking inside and how she how Putana ran away so that people don't get uh, sort of uh, impacted by her you know, yeah. and things like that. Um, so, so my question is uh, with regard to this uh, Akashwani, the 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 divine voice that came twice in the past time and both times I think uh, he was called this fool. Now is is that common and also is is the reason for that is it because of the curse of the six sons of Marichi to be born as sons of Kalanimi and Kalanimi to become uh, Kamsa so that they get killed quickly because if the if that Akashwani didn't come still Krishna would have been born and they would have been alive. So is that to get them to go back to their heavenly kingdom and also some of the other children to be killed by Putana and others so that they go back? Is, is that Okay, answer? yeah. So is the Akashwani common? And what is the purpose of that Akashwani? Without it also Krishna could have been born. Yeah. It's, it's not so easy uh, to isolate one particular incident from a chain of incidents and to assess what would have been the impact of this or if this had not happened this way, if that had not happened that way. There is a whole, uh, they call it history and contra history or alternative history. Now only, you know, if, if in this war this person had, instead of attacking here, had attacked here, what would have happened? or maybe more familiar to us is contra cricket history. Say, if say India recently lost uh, in the semi-finals in the World Cup and so many people become self-appointed commentators. Only if this batsman had come early, only if this baller had bowled like this, only if this person had come before. <laughs> so now would that have changed? Well, maybe, maybe we don't know. Maybe some other batsman comes before but that batsman also gets out, who knows. So. So it's difficult to isolate a particular element from a whole narrative, but still broadly we can see a couple of things. That is the celestial voice common? Well, you could say it's not unheard of. It's not that it happens every day, but we see in the first canto also, uh, Narad Muni hears a voice when he's been performing, he's a Narada boy, and he's performing tapas, he's performing austerity, he sees the Lord, He's delighted on seeing the Lord, but then the Lord disappears. And then after that he hears a voice that, because you are impure at heart and incomplete in service, you cannot see me now. But this glimpse I, you have been given so that uh, you can long for me. And your longing for me will free you from all other longings. And then you can come to me. Ultimate, you will attain me ultimately. So we see that, but we don't see that very common. Basically, the idea is that this is the terrestrial realm, the celestial realm. And interactions between the terrestrial and the celestial realms do happen, between the earthly and heavenly realms do happen. They are not uncommon, devtas sometimes appear on the earth, sometimes in yajna, sometimes at other times, sometimes say Arjuna goes through the heavens. So the specific mean, modes of interaction between the terrestrial and celestial may vary. And in each context, it may be for a particular purpose. When Ram is fighting with Ravan, towards the end, uh, Indra sends his own chariot and charioteer. Now, it is Indra only who has, in a sense, uh, who has gone to Brahma and through that Vishnu has been invoked and Ram has descended. So that has been earlier done already, but specifically in a visible way that intervention happens just before the final war. So celestial terrestrial interactions do happen uh, in the form of Akashwani, they are not that common. Now in this particular case, as you rightly pointed out, what all does it serve? Yes, it does serve to accelerate, to dramatize and accelerate the appearance of Krishna. So basically, now Krishna could have come and killed Kamsa, but how would the, it could just have appeared to be just killing someone. The person's demoniac nature, if it had not come out, 
if krishna is killing him wouldn't have been justified so normally in ordinary situations anybody can behave like a nice person but it is when we are provoked what do we do all of us even when we are provoked we might deviate from our normal behavior some people are very gentle nice person but when they get angry they become like a different person but all of us even within our anger have limits say some of us even when we get angry we might never speak certain foul words certain bad words you will never speak or no matter how much get we angry we get we might not take some physical weapon to hit someone so we all have our limits but some people have no limits and their normal behavior and their provoked behavior are so different that somebody who has not seen their provoked behavior will not be able to believe that this person can behave like this so then for the world to know the extent to which they can go when they are when they are provoked sometimes they need to be provoked so krishna does this very often krishna makes that arrangement through various people for that to happen so comes as cruelty becomes visible to the world when his when the akashwani comes and then his behavior alters radically the same sister whom he is very affectionately carrying as the charioteer in his chariot he suddenly turns to kill her immediately that's the extent of his his evil disposition which comes out so at one level we could say that the akashwani happened just to expose to the world how demoniac comes is and then thereafter is comes a killed all the previous babies and that is brutal but that was the way also those babies got liberated got de- delivered from being born here on the earth quickly and leaving and as you said that was a as a whole story behind that so we could say there are multiple generally see the idea is for one incident uh, you could find explanation that various different levels say if i am speaking right now to you and you can't hear what i'm speaking you could say that is because maybe this mic volume is low you could sometimes say that my my speaking is volume is low or you could say maybe your hearing volume your hearing has gone down or maybe you could say the acoustics of this room are bad so you could have various explanations so generally we go toward the most most obvious explanation the most immediate explanation as long as it makes sense so we could go to various levels and other explanations can also be true so in this case as you rightly said the explanation about those six children are also true but the immediate context is that akashwani uh, that heavenly voice actually revealed kamsa's hellish side okay thank you yes uh, from my question is like mother uh, putna was given the position of a mother um which she fed the breast milk to lord krishna so my question is is this something because of her past deeds like it was destined to be or was it like if somebody comes to lord krishna knowingly or unknowingly and he delivers a new okay yeah this part of the past time i'm going to speak another class in future and how krishna delivered putana but still let's mention this briefly so your question is that was it destiny that she became the uh, she became krishna's mother she was delivered in the spiritual world or was it because any for any reason she comes and come when he comes to krishna and offers something to them to him they will be delivered definitely it's not destiny a destiny if generally we have this idea of what is destiny destiny basically is you could say the kind of situations that befall us in our life how we respond to those situations is up to us sometimes we also use the word destiny in another sense 
that somebody was destined for greatness, somebody is a small child is a sort of mathematical prodigy, then he's fulfilled his destiny, he has become a great mathematician. So we use it in that different sense also, that what somebody is meant to achieve. So was Putana meant to achieve Krishna? No. In this case, it was Krishna's extraordinary mercy. Now, is it true that anybody who approaches Krishna for any purpose, they get they get purified? Yeah, that is true. Uh, it is said that Gopya Kamad Bhayat Kamso Dvesha Chaidya Dayon Rupaha. So that different people come to Krishna for different reasons. And because they become personally absorbed in Krishna, they become purified by that absorption. Now, in the case of uh, Putana, so for example, Kamsa was constantly absorbed in Krishna out of fear. Oh, well, comes Krishna, will come and kill me, Krishna will come and kill me. So it is described he was so absorbed that at night when he would be lying down and his wife would come near him, hey, Krishna has come. So he would not see his wife, he would see Krishna. That was the level of his absorption. And similarly, the Sishupala also was absorbed in the envy. There is no description specifically that Putana was absorbed like that in Krishna. So different characters illustrate different principles of bhakti or different principles of life. So when Kamsa is eventually delivered or when Shishupal is delivered, that Ill illustrates the principle of the fruit of absorption. That if one is anyway absorbed in Krishna, they will be elevated. It is not just approaching Krishna. Approaching Krishna is the beginning. It is absorption in Krishna. So, it is that they were absorbed in Krishna, so they were elevated and liberated. In the case of Putana, there is no description that she was that absorbed in Krishna constantly. She was just deputed by Kamsa to kill Krishna. So, in the case of Kamsa, her, in the case of uh, Putana, her deliverance is not so is a demonstration not so much of the potency of absorption as the potency of Krishna's mercy, Krishna's extraordinary reciprocation. So normal, uh, so when we see, there is a word called causeless mercy. Now, what does causeless mercy mean? It means that the cause is too less for the mercy. There is a cause, but normally we have reciprocation. Say so if uh, if person A gives somebody hundred hundred dollars, then they give them some some product which is hundred dollars. So that is equal dealing. Mercy means that it's completely disproportionate. Something which we don't deserve, we are given. So causeless mercy doesn't mean that there is absolutely no cause. There is a cause, but there is no proportionality. Uh, there is the cause is very little and the result what is given is very very large so in the case of Bhutana Krishna saw see there is a the spiritual principle and there is a material principle and both can work in parallel mm -hmm. say for example mm, If somebody has got diabetes and they see some gulab jam and it's prasad, oh this is prasad, how can I refuse it? Now they take the prasad. Now you could say prasad always purifies, yes it always purifies, but the purification is at the spiritual level. At the material level, if somebody has diabetes, and they <laughs> there will be a result at the material level, isn't it? <laughs> so, if you wanted purification only, then you could have taken rice and chapati also. Why did you take gulab jamun? Is it specifically? So, if you are taking it for purification, then that particular thing which we took that might be inappropriate because it has some effect at the material level also. So, whenever, so in the case of Putana coming toward Krishna, at that time, that the spiritual level, because she had this spark of maternal affection, or at least maternal action that she did. 
so because of that krishna appreciated that at least has come with the maternal matter she has done some maternal actions and is described that she was in her previous life krutamala and she was the bra- she was the sister of uh, balim a uh, sister of uh, balim maharaj and when she saw vamana uh, at that small time so she was so happy to see this is nice boy and she had some maternal affection towards her but then immediately that maternal affection changed when she saw that vamana dev has taken everything away from balim maharaj she became very angry with him so from that previous life also from this life also there was a small amount of uh, positive action or positive intention whichever way you want to look at it and krishna appreciated that but this was at the spiritual level at the spiritual level krishna took that small oh you have a desire you have acted as if you want to give milk to me i will give you the facility to forever offer milk to me that was at the spiritual level but at the material level because she acted in terms of a murderess so she got the result at the material level the material level the result was that she tried to kill krishna and then the normal principle is if somebody tries to assassinate you kill you then in self defense you can kill that person so she got the result at the material level because of her evil actions but because those evil actions were done in a way that was there was some maternal affection over there so she was elevated so it's krishna's causeless mercy it's not not destiny in that case it's there were some factors which have come from a previous life but just those previous life factors were not enough it was krishna's special mercy that led to her elevation okay thank you so yes ma'am looking at the shrimad bhagavat from our past times and being able to extract um more practical examples how can we practice that more when we're when we are reading those those scriptures or or past times so like how can we um try to seek that more often than just just reading it for the sake of reading it okay so how can we learn to draw practical lessons from scripture of course devotion is ultimately practical so but still i understand your question see there are different ways in which we can approach scripture mm-hmm. say some devotee might be a doctor prabhu is a doctor now so now if i come to prabhu because i have got some disease the way i approach him and the way he approaches me will be different say if i am coming as a as a speaker so we will have different kinds of interactions so similarly see it's our purpose that determines our perspective so we could approach scripture in different ways uh, madhacharya talks about three levels of approaching the epics it's primarily the mahabharat and the ramayana but it applies to the bhagavatam also he talks about this in brahma sutra bhashya his commentary on the bhagavatam and commentary on the brahma sutra basically so there he says you can approach scripture at the literal ethical and metaphorical levels so at the literal level it's just the story and we just hear the story and relish the story and so this could be a very devotional approach to scripture hmm? where oh this just tell the story in a very sweet way and become absorbed in its sweetness and that's wonderful if we can do that there are times for that also and then there is the ethical way the ethical way is we approach scripture as a guide for our ethical decision making and that means okay this character acted in this way this character acted in that way and we learn something from that we have to be careful that we don't judge the characters as right or wrong we only see those characters actions as guides for our actions because they are they are great characters mostly in the scriptures and we don't want to put ourselves in the morally superior position of judging them but we want to learn from them and then third would be the metaphorical where certain characters can represent certain things and this all three to do that 
and to gain something from that it requires a certain amount of maturity and certain amount of expertise even the first literal if somebody is literally only <coughs> repeat the story after some time you might just get bored with it i've heard it so many times but somebody who can imbue it with rasa with devotion that that expertise is there then even the story is the same sometimes some people recite it such sweetness that we love hearing it similarly for ethical if we ourselves are uh, um, experienced and expert then we can draw the right lessons from there generally there's a it's a it's a big subject but i'll try to explain as quickly as possible that for learning anything um, from some incident that is quite different from the incident that we are going through there is something called the ladder of abstraction the ladder of abstraction basically means if you consider a ladder at the bottom of it is everything specific at the bottom of it is something abstract now generally uh, for any learning to happen for there has to be a combination of the specific or uh, the concrete and the abstract so for example if a news says that oh the population of polar bears in alaska has gone down okay that's some interesting information but i'm not interested maybe i'm interested i don't know but then you say that indicates that global warming is for real so now what has happened is a specific point but from there there is something more universal that is true so if it's only specific it's only entertaining if it's only abstract then it's too abstract it doesn't engage us so basically whenever communication happens it has to be a combination of the concrete and the abstract so we go up and down the ladder of abstraction so now with respect to applying things to our context so it's like say the scriptures were spoken thousands of years ago so they are at a particular level particular time context particular time in history so that's the point of concrete at the bottom of the ladder of abstraction so from there you come up and then another ladder of abstraction brings us down to our level and then we can understand so for starting from this point going to the top and then coming to the bottom on our side we can broadly ask three questions so whenever any such particular thing happens anything happens in scripture and what does this mean in its original context so what does this mean in the original context then what is the context independent significance of this so some particular action is there what is the context independent principle underlying this that is, that will take us to the top of the ladder of abstraction and then to come down to the bottom of the ladder of abstract abstraction okay how does that context independent in principle apply to me in my context that how does this context so if we do these three things what is the meaning of this in its original context what is the context independent principle and what is the contextual application of that principle in my context then we can draw some practical lessons from a scripture say i'm talking about the ladder of abstraction and actually it's abstract right now <laughs> <laughs> let me give you some simple example to illustrate this say we know that in chaitanya lila chaitanya mahaprabhu refused to see the king pratap mm. so that is a incident now we see ishla prabhupa is probably the most prominent follower of ishla prabhupa of chaitanya mahaprabhu in today's times but in prabhupa was in america and he, some of his followers in india told him that is opportunity to meet indira gandhi prabhupa cut down his america tour and went all the way to india to meet the head of the state now prabhu now chaitanya mahaprabhu was very conscientious the king was in puri chaitanya mahaprabhu was in puri the king wanted to come to meet him and chaitanya mahaprabhu refused and prabhupada seems to have done exactly the opposite he went to meet the head of state so why is that so we have to look at what is the 
to make sense of this what do you learn from this what is the uh, what is the what did that action mean in that context so in that context it meant that uh, chaitanya mahaprabhu said at least that if people see a sanyasi hobnobbing with the king they think what is this it's not detached and it will spoil the reputation of sanyasi and if sanyasi's reputation is spoiled if a if people expect a renunciate to be renounced if people see a renunciate is attached then they will not want to hear from him so then he felt that his capacity to teach anything spiritual will be impeded so the point over there was in that context his meeting the king would have damaged his reputation so what is the context independent principle you come to the top of the ladder instru- instruction is that you know uh, we need to be conscious of people's perception not that we just let people's perception guide our actions alone uh, but we have to be aware if our reputation if somebody's reputation is spoiled then they cannot do their service so we need to protect our reputation now what would be the contextual application in, in today's world in today's world people will actually be quite impressed if a spiritual leader meets a head of state because at that time the overall understanding was such that there is another world and that is the world we have to go to so somebody who is pursuing that world why what are they doing with somebody who is trying to rule this world so there was an understanding there is another world and we have to go to that world in today's idea there is the idea of another world it's it doesn't most people don't connect with it at all so they think if somebody renounces this world that the person is living a worthless life oh but somebody renounces this world that person is meeting with somebody who is ruling this world oh then this renounce world must be person is renounced must be having something special so it will enhance the reputation today so therefore the actions are opposite but the intention is the same the intention is to facilitate one's uh, service by shaping public public perception in a way that is receptive for the service so of course this is a, one one example but like that if we look, move up and down the ladder of abstraction then we can see what we can learn from specific incidents and specific stories also okay so thank you very much shri krishna bhagwan ki shri la prabhupad ki गौर भक्त वृंद की गौर प्रेमानंदे